For some teams, there's only 10 games left. It's time we break down all of the action from yesterday in Skybet League One. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. We're getting closer to 8,000 subscribers by the minute. And of course, you can do it for free by hitting the button below. Let's begin with the first game at Fratton Park. I can't avoid it. It's Pompey against Oxford United. It finishes Portsmouth 2, Oxford United 1. The non-penalty XG 0.83 to 1.03. A game defined on one very important aspect of football, chance conversion. Pompey took theirs. Oxford, well, theirs left frustrated. Let's touch on Pompey first. Their performance in isolation was very pretty. I, if I'm being totally honest, I wasn't very impressed. But the finer details were executed better than their opposition. If John Massinho was to present his preferred footballing identity, he wouldn't show you that performance. But he also wouldn't care. And what I mean by that is grinding their way through games, becoming monsters at game management and using the fine margins to their advantage. That's what he'd care about. And that's exactly what Pompey did and what the best sides do. We're looking at Oxford over the 19 minutes. That probably was the best Oxford performance under Des Buckingham. A plan was visible and it came to fruition for large moments. For the first time under Des, on a consistent basis, Oxford played with a tempo, pace and purpose. It was a glimpse of what this squad can do when coached and set up correctly. We saw it in the early stages of the season, of course, under another manager. It felt like the players had nothing to lose and in a way that's frustrating because why can't that be showed in the games prior but it also was a sense of encouragement. They took the game to who I think will be the eventual champions and that approach in the end I think deserves something. When looking at the graph in front of you, the graph matches the eye test, an end-to-end -end game of football with neither team really taking control, but looking very effective in transition. If you break down all three goals in isolation, the first is a quick, early move. The second two are, again, all involving quick breakaways. Pompey second, slightly helped by a corner flag, but again, fine margins win games. And I mean, that moment definitely was a fine margin. The length of the bars, though, also suggests Oxford created the better chances when they came forward, breaking up the majority of Pompey's rhythm well. And not many sides have done that, especially at Fratton Park. But it's conversion. And again, Michael Owen quoting coming, goals win games. When looking at the stats, sometimes the metrics can be misleading, but I watched the game in the away end and I feel exactly the same as I did at full time, sitting here on Sunday afternoon. Oxford had seven more shots than Portsmouth, 18 in total, and between boxes looked like the better team, but it's only the penalty that was converted. Oxford doubled the number of touches inside the box, but it all means nothing when you can't finish. Why did Pompey win this game? Not because of their effective build-up, not because of a creative masterclass, but because they took their chances. The best teams find a way to win. I sound like a broken record, but it's the truth. They outscored their XG yesterday by 1.67. They're utterly clinical. If I was being extra picky of this Oxford performance, I'd highlight how bad we were at set pieces. We had opportunities to whip that ball into the box. Seven corners, multiple free kicks. Oxford only accumulated a set play XG of 0.11, which is, I mean, pretty much harmless from a Pompey perspective defending that. So far under those Buckingham's clear set pieces haven't been the top priority. When looking at key players for Pompey, two stood out. Joe Rafferty at right back and Marlon Pack in the centre of the park. The experienced heads in this side. Marlon Pack is a Rolls-Royce midfielder. We knew that. Everything is done with composure and a sense of calmness. Exactly what this youthful Pompey squad needs. Without a defensive pivot partner, his job was made even harder. But again, he stood out and led by example. His assist for Sadie's goal is going under the radar. The pass is well-timed and completely immaculate. Over the 90 minutes, he created two big chances, 12 passes into the final third and six successful defensive actions. Once again, Marlon Pack and Joe Rafferty experience they led through performance. When looking at key players from an Oxford perspective, we order the importance of wide players in a Des Buckingham team. Well, I mean, Dan and Josh Murphy, they really stepped up yesterday. The ability to go 1v1 was an element that caused Pompey problems all afternoon. You add some final product. Again, it's if buts and maybes, but they could have been match winners. Josh Murphy accumulated three chances, two efforts hitting the post and four passes into the final third. His resurgence as a player under Buckingham hasn't gone unnoticed. Next up, Fleetwood 4, Wigan 2, the XG exactly 1 to 0.47. I've been wanting to chat about Fleetwood on these roundups for such a long time and this is an opportunity to do so. 
This Fleetwood side will fight until the death. Everything that was missing before Charlie Adam arrived fell into place yesterday. The technical side was present, and we'll touch on that later, but the immense character made the difference. They outfought, they outran, and for large parts, outplayed Wigan. And let's be honest, not many times this season, if any, have Fleetwood collectively done all of those things. Seven points from safety, teams above and below them in worse form. They couldn't, could they? I, I don't know. It, they could, though. They could. Let's touch on Wigan next. Tuesday hangover, potentially, but the inconsistency hasn't just arrived at Wigan. This season, Sean Maloney's side have only won back-to-back -back League One games twice. It's a basic point, but probably highlights Wigan's biggest limitation this season. Of course, the deduction at the start of the campaign didn't help. But again, lack of consistency has been a downfall for the majority of the campaign. When looking at the momentum graph brought to you by SofaScore, it doesn't scream a six-goal game, which means two things. Either we're looking at some wonder goals or poor defending. From a Wigan perspective, you're definitely looking at some sloppy defending. Again, some are more avoidable than others, and we'll touch and credit on the individuals later, but in general, there's far too many cheap mistakes for my liking. When looking at the metrics, if you ask Nappers for his biggest frustration of the season, he'll probably say something along the lines of Fleetwood's failure to do the right things in the biggest moments. Yesterday, I'd say they did the total opposite. Fleetwood currently sit ninth for big chances created and have the 11th best expected goals out of every team in the division but they're sat in 23rd. Defensively, things haven't been great, but going forward, they've also missed 46 big chances, the fourth worst in the league. It proves yesterday everything fell into place. In fact, they outscored their XG by three, and according to the metrics, they didn't register a single clear-cut chance. I'm not totally with that. I've watched the game. I think Stockley's header probably was a big chance converted well. But it does show when they're clinical, they can be a great team. And they've got a great squad there. They've left it maybe slightly too late, but they're showing signs. And at the moment, Nappers, he just wants those signs. And again, where could that lead them? We're looking at key players. Boston Lowell is the man stealing the headlines. The bloke has come to life in recent weeks. His presence alone gives that Fleetwood team an advantage. But his second goal just shows that technical ability is up to scratch as well. He's got a Basuma Yaya Toure playing style about him. Powerful, intelligent, and a desire to drive with the ball. Over the 90 minutes, he accumulated two goals, two chances created, three passes into the final third, two successful dribbles, and seven defensive actions. He's a number six, number eight, a creative number 10, but also can finish like a number nine as well. That man looks to be a great pick up on loan from Celtic. I think if he returns to League One next season, it could be a great deal for quite a few teams. At Pride Park, it finishes Derby 3, Port Vale nil. the XG 1.05 to 0.16. It doesn't get much more straightforward than that for Derby. Back to winning ways in the most comfortable of fashions. Let's chat Derby first. It was cruise control for the Rams. They made it look the easiest task of the season. It was a thoroughly professional job. Did they ever need to get out of first gear? Probably not, but a plan built on organisation control and attacking fluidity was executed to perfection. The race for the top two might not have tightened, but it hasn't widened. If there was time to put this derby wobble to bed, yesterday was very important. When looking at Port Vale, losing at Pride Park isn't embarrassing, and I'm not going to rip them apart because of that, but approaching a game in that manner with little intention of earning anything is a very, very big problem. They're slipping down the table rapidly. That's Darren Moore's third defeat as Port Vale manager. He's picked up just a single point in his opening four matches in charge. A manager built on principles of galvanisation is looking like a pretty pathetic managerial bounce. He needs to turn things around pretty quickly if they've got any chance of survival. When looking at the graph in front of you, Port Vale's initial game plan was ruined inside three minutes. Look at that start from Derby. The aim to keep the match tight and compact was destroyed within Derby's first phase of play. As the numbers will show us in a moment, Port Vale offered nothing in the final third. Any possession was worthless and passive, making Derby's job of control and eventual game management even easier. 
When looking at the stats, the eye test is sometimes more important than the numbers. Unfortunately for Port Vale, neither provide much joy. Along with very brief spells of intent, the output and final product is unforgivable. Derby side had a total of three shots with not a single on target or blocked. Only Cheltenham this weekend also failed to accumulate a shot on goal, but even they had five blocked efforts. Darren Moore's attacking team selection was extremely bizarre. It was almost as like everything was on defending and when that didn't work and they had to go forward, there was no real plan. Take a look at the structure that doesn't look very structured. Gavin Massey is the most central option for Port Vale and he's probably their biggest wide threat. Ben Garrity was the only forward option. I say that loosely because, I mean, look at his position. He's basically playing as a central midfielder, but that says quite a lot about Port Vale's attacking setup. He only touched the ball five times into the Derby box. The lack of strikers selected yesterday, but also recruited in January, continues to cause more problems. The decision to not sign a striker in that January window is looking worse by the game. They've scored the fourth least amount of open play goals this season out of every team competing in Sky Bet League One. When looking at the average positions, whatever you think of Darren Moore as a tactician, he actually highlighted Derby's biggest threat post-match. When comparing average positions, it's clear Port Vale's central disorganisation allowed Derby space in the key areas. Derby's wingbacks had an absolute bloody field day, creating and scoring two of their three goals. Port Vale couldn't keep things compact and got overloaded time and time again on the flanks. And that brings us nicely to the key players, the wingbacks for Derby County, Ward and Sibley. That partnership was immense, taking full advantage of the license and ability to create in front of them. Ward assisted Sibley twice with two balls across goal. He finished the match with five chances created and expected assists total of 0.59, the most and highest out of anyone on the pitch. So around the grounds we go, it finishes Shrewsbury nil, Blackpool 2, Leighton Orient nil, Bristol Rovers 1, Cheltenham nil, Burton nil, Wickham 2, Barnsley 4, Four, Port Vale 2, Oxford 1, Peterborough 2, Exeter 1, Northampton 1, Charlton 1, Lincoln 0, Stevenage 0, Fleetwood 4, Wigan 2, Carlisle 1, Reading 3, Bolton 2, Cambridge 0 and Derby 3, Port Vale 0. Thank you so much for tuning in today for the roundup. Of course, let me know in the comments down below how do you reflect on your team's weekend of action. Until next time, I've been Jack. This has been the Jack Wood Football Podcast and I will see you all very, very soon. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Take care.